So as I said, I work for the Center for Health Security and th there's my Twitter uh, handle there. If you're interested in what I do, you can always follow me there because I'm always tweeting about uh, stuff that I, I work on. And I do a lot of media appearances too regarding the pandemic and other infectious disease issues. So the Center for Health Security is a, a think tank that works to really prevent the bad, nasty consequences from epidemics, disasters, infectious disease emergencies, and try to make the world more resilient to infectious disease challenges. We've been doing this since 1997. Obviously, our work has gotten very prominent during the pandemic, but we do, we've do we been doing this for some time, writing lots of reports and write, uh, working on a lot of issues that really don't, the general public doesn't really see because most of the times we don't get a pandemic this bad, but we've been doing this for some time. And a lot of the things that we focus on are really trying to protect people's health from biological infectious disease threats, including better preparedness and response programs. And you all have seen how important that is in this pandemic. Trying to get awareness among leaders. Most politicians and policy leaders don't think about infectious disease threats the way they, they need to. And I think that's been really evident during this pandemic uh, because people thought this isn't, going, this isn't something that could happen. Uh, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, our last pandemic was not a very deadly pandemic. So that got people a little bit kind of lulled into thinking a pandemic in the 21st century is not going to be a big deal. And I think it's really going to take, it takes a lot of effort to get politicians to think about infectious diseases and to think about public health infrastructure as part of national security. And then just trying to connect a lot of people there. So we'll skip over those there. So we've got a lot of different people there. So it's important to remember that. So when you're a, when you're working in global health or in public health or in, or in medicine or healthcare, it's not just one way. You can do a lot of different, uh, a lot of different things. So, at our tank, people from that are lawyers, anthropologists, technology specialists, communication specialists, a lot of different things, as well as doctors, as, ep as well as epidemiologists. So there's many different routes. It's not always, and I think when you're in high school, it's important to remember it's not always go to medical school or do go get a PhD. There's a lot of different ways, and I think it's important to remember that most of the field is very multidisciplinary and there's lots of things you can do even without a medical degree or with a medical degree or however you want to approach it. So I would really spend some time thinking about that. So I'm gonna show you, I'm just gonna go a little bit quickly here. So, you know, um, a couple of things that we do are um, a pandemic exercises. So this is a pandemic exercise that the center conducted prior to the pandemic called Cladex, where we started thinking about a moderately contagious and moderately lethal pathogen and how things would play out. And we did a, a very big kind of glitzy, uh, glitzy type of exercise in, in, in Washington, DC with a lot of uh, former leaders in government just to show how this would all play out. So that's one thing to do is, is to really think about this. So it's really important also when you hear about the pandemic, when you think this wasn't predictable, that this couldn't have happened, We've been studying this for some time. We've been doing tabletop exercises. There was a playbook and that playbook was largely discarded. People didn't do what, what was necessary to do early on, at least in this country. And I think it's important to remember that this wasn't something that completely took us by surprise. This was something that where a lot of human errors made a major difference. So since COVID-19, our center has been doing a lot of work on, on, on the pandemic, we've written multiple different multiple different papers, multiple different reports, uh, lots of op-eds, lots of media uh, all over the world, really trying to get information out to the general public and to policy leaders to try and uh, lessen the impact of COVID-19 and also to set the stage to prepare for the, the next pandemic in a much better way. So some of the projects I'm gonna talk about are, are ones that I was involved in. Um, and I, I've listed some of them there. I'm gonna try and just give you the flavor of the kind of work I do, which is not bench research. It's more about a lot of thought problems and a lot of um, policy, trying to figure out the policy angle to certain things and trying to make things better uh, in that interface between science and, and policy. So the first project I wanna talk about was the, it's, it's a project trying to understand which types of pathogens, which types of microorganisms have the ability to cause a pandemic. There are a lot of, there are a lot of different, there are a lot of different microorganisms out there, most of which don't even pose any harm to humans. But there is some subset of them that can infect humans, and of that, even a smaller subset that can cause an infectious disease emergency or a high consequence events. And we've always been preparing for pandemics. People think about flu, for example, or we think about biological weapons that the former Soviet Union had. But most of that has just been based on the fact that you know we knew a flu did this. There's there's a list of things that sound scary. 
And what I wanted to do in this project is really be broad and think, what, well, what is it about a microorganism that allows it to cause a pandemic or to cause an infectious disease emergency? And try to be like in, inductive. You probably learned about induction and deduction in your science class, trying to build this from the ground up, trying to say, well, what traits should a bacteria or a virus or a microorganism have if it's going to be able to cause a major outbreak? And then try to be totally agnostic about it. Don't go in this with preconceived notions saying, oh, it's going to be smallpox and flu, that's it, or, or whatever it might be, to try and say, could it be a fungus? Could it be a bacteria? And that's what I really did in this project. And I think if you're interested in this, if you just Google my name and pandemic pathogens, you'll see a big report. But what I think, so I think this is interesting to, now it's going to sound kind of uh, very obvious because of the pandemic, but this is what I think a, a pandemic pathogen needs to have efficient transmissibility from human to human. It needs to be able to spread between people. It can't just, just infect a human and be kind of a dead end, like, a, like for example, tetanus. One person gets tetanus from the, from the soil, it doesn't spread to anybody else. It doesn't have to have a very high fatality rate. If it's too high of a fatality rate, people are go going to be sick and they're going to die and it's gonna burn itself out. But having a fatality rate where not everybody is in bed, people are able to go out and do things and spread this infection, that's what's more important. And, import, and what we've seen during COVID, and this is something that I think now sounds obvious, but wasn't completely always obvious, that if something is contagious during its incubation period, meaning you can spread it when you don't know that you're sick, that's make, that makes a, a pathogen almost entirely uh, impossible to contain. The same is true with mild illness with contagiousness. If people can go out because they've got sniffles, uh, and then spread an infection that's much more likely to cause a pandemic than people who are really sick in bed and can't be around other people. Obviously, in um, the pathogen, you want it that the they should be what I call immunologically naive, meaning they've not seen it, they don't have any built-up immunity or vaccines or treatments for it, um, and their immune system can't really control it. That's all kind of what you need to put it, that's kind of what will cause a pandemic. And there's a picture of the of the report cover, which I urge you to read if you're interested in this type of thing. But a lot of this will, will sound now, like I said, something very familiar to everybody because the world really got up to speed during COVID-19, but it wasn't something that we thought about in, in that kind of way before that. So how would, a trans, how, how would these things transmit? How would a pathogen transmit if it's going to be able to cause an, an infectious disease emergency? Usually respiratory droplet transmission, because if something spreads when people talk, laugh, cough, sneeze, that's, and breathe, that's much harder to stop than if something is spread through the fecal oral route, which you can just fix through sanitation. So if something is, is spread because people's toilets, or because people are, are, are exposed to other people's feces, like many infectious diseases are, you can fix that with sanitation much harder to do that with respiratory droplet transmission. People have to follow public health guidance and we've seen during the pandemic, they don't. Um, there are some mosquito-borne illnesses, but mosquito-borne illnesses can cause a lot of problems, but they usually are restricted to the geographic range of the mosquito. So that really limits it. So what we're talking about are respiratory pathogens. And so, so what, what that means is that when you're looking at pandemic preparedness, when you're thinking all of these types of viruses, bacteria, fungi, what you wanna focus on are respiratory spread illnesses. And within there is likely to be viruses, not bacteria, not fungi, not protozoa, because viruses mutate very quickly. There are no broad spectrum antiviral agents, the way we have antibiotics for bacterial infections, even hard to treat bacterial infections. You can usually craft something that will be effective. So respiratory viruses are what you should remember as a pandemic threat. So anytime somebody freaks out about Ebola or whatever, remember those are gonna be those are gonna be disruptive events, but they're not gonna cause a pandemic. Uh, it's respiratory viruses basically all the way down when it comes to pandemic threats. So another project I worked on was on vaccine platforms. Again, this is all gonna sound very obvious post pandemic, but uh, this was something that, had, that, that, that I did before the pandemic. So what is a vaccine platform? And I think you guys are all play video games probably, but you all play them online. When I was a, a little kid, we had an Atari system or Nintendo or Sega, whatever you want to think. And you had this, you had this platform, this, this um, console, and you just flipped out different cartridges if you wanted to play Donkey Kong or if you wanted to play Pac-Man or whatever it might be. That, that's what I'm talking about with the vaccine platform, that you've got some common way to basically plug and play, just switch things out so you've got new vaccines. And people have been talking about these theoretically for some time. 
And we knew that when there is an infectious disease emergency, the most important thing to stop it is likely going to be a vaccine. And vaccines in the past had taken years, four years was the fastest vaccine. So vaccine platform technologies were a way to cut that time down so that we would have vaccines much, much faster. But we really hadn't seen them rise to the occasion yet. They were just, they, these were experimental, people have been working on them. People had made a lot of advances, but they had never had a chance to, to do anything. And what I did in this, in this project was I really looked at the technologies that were out there, things like mRNA vaccine technology that you're hearing about with Moderna and, and Pfizer, or the, the adenovirus technology, which is using another virus to deliver the, the spike protein of COVID-19 into a body, trying to see, could that really change the way we thought about infectious disease emergencies and make things much easier, much quicker than in the past? And I did a project looking at all of those. And I, I really came to the conclusion that mRNA vaccines were really going to be uh, instrumental because even though they're not quite like plug and play, they, they basically, you can just print them off from your, from your printer, as long as you know the sequence of the organism or of the part of the organism you need to target with your immune system, you can basically just do this. And I think the, the mRNA and DNA, the, the mRNA vaccine platforms, as well as probably to a lesser extent DNA platforms, they basically are recipes where you can just print them off. And if you look, for example, at the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, it took them hours to make that vaccine. It took Moderna days to make that vaccine. Obviously, it took much longer to scale up production and to do all the safety testing, but to have the vaccine candidate in just a couple of hours to days, that really cha <clears throat> changes the way you face an infectious disease emergency. And I think you guys are going to see the dawn of the beginning of a new revolution in vaccinology where we use things like mRNA vaccine technology. So there's a lot of potential there, a lot of interest there. So I worked on that ahead of time, uh, kind of emphasizing the fact that vaccine platform technologies were going to be uh, a way that infectious, disease, infectious diseases would really be changed in terms of the treatment. <clears throat> so another cool project I worked on was at-home diagnostics. So you guys all probably know that people can get, get tested at home for basically a few things only. You can check your blood sugar, you can get a pregnancy test, there's an HIV test at home. This wasn't something that people had done that much before because it was something considered kind of difficult to, to find a regulatory pathway to say it's okay for people to test themselves at home. But I recognized and I thought that at-home diagnostics would be really important for infectious diseases, not just for pandemic, not just pandemics, but all the time. How many times do you have coughs and colds and you want to know what you have? You end up going to an urgent care center. They might give you antibiotics, which you probably don't need. But if you could know that you had a virus, you would stay home, you wouldn't infect people, and you wouldn't go get unnecessary antibiotics. And we would all know what types of viruses are out there circulating in a, in a much better degree, because oftentimes you don't get a specific diagnosis. People are just told they've got some virus. And we've seen the proliferation, for example, of things like smart thermometers, where there's lots of people are taking their temperature in a city that tells you that maybe something is going on there. So I, I kind of wanted to expand on that with at-home diagnostics and see how feasible it was. That maybe someday you can have a toaster in your kitchen where you can just test yourself every time you have a cough or a cold and you know what you have. And they would all be networked. And what we've seen now is there was some interest in doing this, only HIV had it, but there was some interest for sexually transmitted infections, some interest for flu. But now with COVID, this, this has been catalyzed and there are multiple at-home tests now available. And I think we have to kind of keep the pressure on to have more of these at-home diagnostics so that you can do a lot of this at home. And maybe you need to have a telemedicine consult with your doctor after you do these tests, but I think having this technology will be really important. Like imagine during COVID-19, we know that we didn't have tests, but if everybody could test themselves for influenza and they were all coming up negative, wouldn't you say there's something going on here that's not flu, that everybody at home is testing? That would have been very, very useful. So this is another project I worked on. And you can see what I've done here is taking the science and then trying to figure out a policy solution or try to figure out how it might change the way we approach things as a society. <clears throat> I also worked on a project. So I also do a lot of work on hospital preparedness. And Hospital preparedness has been a major theme in COVID-19 because that's what flattening the curve was all about. It was trying to keep cases, not to get cases not to zero, but to keep cases below the level where hospitals go into crisis. And now, thankfully, because we've been able to vaccinate so many of our high-risk populations in the United States, we don't really have that, that same problem anymore, that we aren't going to see hospitals go into crisis again from COVID-19. But they definitely did go into crisis, especially in places like New York City in the spring. 
and we did a project where we interviewed people uh, that uh, that were staff members, um, and trying to understand what happened there. When did they realize that they had they didn't have enough resources? And how did that all happen? Was it slow or did they know all of a sudden? And how aware were they? And, and I think that's an important thing to think about as well, that there's a lot of ethical and societal concerns about how you change standards of care, meaning you were doing everything for everybody, but now you can't do everything for everybody. How do you make that transition? How do you, how do you have patients accept that and learn about that and know about that? And how do you as a doctor cope with it? So we worked on a lot of issues regarding that as well. So that's another facet of how we get resilient to, um, to to um, uh, to to uh, infectious disease emergencies and to disasters. So another pro project, just to give you some more flavor of what we do, um, working on the interface between public health and primary care. So most of you probably don't realize, or maybe you do, because you're global, global health, you're interested in global health. That in the United States and, and worldwide, indeed, public health is something that is undervalued for decade after decade after decade, and it's under resourced, understaffed. You can walk into a hospital in 2021 and it looks very modern. All the, 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 all of the gadgets, all of the computers, but you can walk into a health department and it probably doesn't look very much different than it looked in, in the 1950s or 1960s. Uh, it's still lots of pen and paper, fax machines, uh, which didn't exist in the 50s and 60s, but, but it's, it's a little bit dated and behind. And I think it's really important to think about the fact that when you have an infectious disease emergency, public health becomes your response agency. And if you are under-resourced, if you're undervalued, if you don't actually prioritize it, and I would say during COVID-19 in the United States, time after time, this was not prioritized. Why did we have a surge in the summer? Why did we have surges in the winter? Because we didn't have enough public health infrastructure to test, trace, and isolate. We could not keep up. Most governors didn't even hire contact tracers, even when they said they were going to. And when they hired them, they didn't hire enough. And then they scratched their heads wondering why cases spiraled out of control. So I think that's an important thing we have to fix is public health infrastructure. And that means not having it go through cycles of boom and bust when, when everybody's interested in it, when there's a bad thing going on and it's in the headlines, that's all, in, that's, all, that's all good. But what happens when it's not in the headlines and the funding goes away and the public health agencies are left, are, are again, again under-resourced. So I think we really have to fix this. One way to help with that could be to have primary care doctors interface more with public health. So we've got family medicine doctors and other types of primary care doctors out there who's pay, who, who the patients really trust. Could they help with things like contact tracing or testing or, or, or vaccines? All of that would be really important. And there's probably a way to have them synergize because most times public health agencies don't have much input or much interaction with the primary care, uh, with, with primary care providers, but they have a lot of overlap and a lot of shared interests. And what we're doing in this, in this study is doing a lot of case studies around the US to see how did public health agencies interact with primary care doctors during the pandemic and did they actually help each other out? So that's another way to look at a scientific or a medical or a healthcare problem and trying to figure out what the best policy might be moving forward. The last project I wanna mention is something um, about the fact that, you know, I said earlier that when it comes to what will cause a pandemic, what will cause an infectious disease emergency. I talked about viruses and I said, it's not likely to be bacteria. Why is it not likely to be bacteria? Because we've got broad spectrum antibiotics. Since the advent of penicillin in the 1920s and then commercialized in the 1940s, we've had kind of a revolution in antibiotics. And although we have major problems with antibiotic resistance, they're not the same threat because we've got so many antibiotics. But when you think about viruses, we have very few antivirals. We've got a lot of antivirals for HIV or hepatitis C, but outside of that, there's not very many other antivirals. And when we do have them, they're very specific. So a drug like Tamiflu only works on influenza. It doesn't have any other activity. Whereas an antibiotic, like for example, Cipro, it works on multiple different types of bacteria. So we don't have very many antivirals. So I think what, when this project, what I'm trying to do is advocate that we start looking at viral antiviral compounds for families of viruses. Because we know there's about six viral families that are most likely to be where the next pandemic virus comes from. So if we had antivirals and people looking at those viral families to try to make antivirus, make, make antivirals for maybe, maybe a lesser, maybe a lesser uh, cousin in that family, maybe one that causes uh, upper respiratory tract infections that are mild but bothersome enough, that might get us down the pathway to having an antiviral for one of the other members of the family that could be more dangerous. And I think that's what we need to kind of think about doing is moving away from just kind of 
single virus types of things to thinking about what can we do in a whole viral family? Look at all of them. Are there, are there places where we can find something that's the same among them all? So if we have an antiviral, it will work on all of them. Or will, 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 can we do work on one virus that will be useful on the other viruses? So I think that's a new program that I'm trying to advocate for to develop medical countermeasures. Again, it's another example of me taking a scientific problem, a scientific question, and trying to bridge it to a policy, uh, a policy solution. So, so that's kind of just, a, I, I just wanted to give you a flavor of some of the projects that I work on. I also take care of patients. I'm, I'm taking care of patients right now. I have an electronic medical record open behind my screen uh, where I'm, I'm, I'm still on, I'm on call this weekend. And, and, I, and so I do that as well. Um, and I talk a lot to the media. I talk a lot to the press about infectious diseases. And so I'm happy to take questions on any of those subjects or any infectious disease subject in the remaining time. I've got about 15 or so minutes um, uh, before I need to get back to patient stuff. So. Um, hopefully that was useful to you. Hopefully that gives you some ideas of different ways to think about problems in this field. And again, thank you for your attention. Thank you for the, the invitation. Hi, my name's Sam. Uh, I am a rising sophomore from Solon, Ohio. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It's really, really insightful. Uh, I just have a question about the vaccine platforms, and this is more of just like a curio uh, curiosity. Um, what really is the difference in performance, at least, between mRNA vaccines and DNA vaccines? Like the genetic material itself is different, but what difference does that constitute in performance? So, good question. Um, you are really smart, rising sophomore. So, an mRNA, so mRNA and DNA. So, there's a whole section. There's a whole category of platform technologies called nucleic acid pat platforms, and you can divide those into mRNA. And there's several different types of mRNA vaccine platforms and then DNA. So initially people looked a lot at DNA platforms and there were DNA platforms being thought of for Zika virus, if you remember that, and DNA platforms even for COVID-19. But what, what happens is yes, they aren't very different in that sense, but remember if from your biology class where in a human cell DNA is, it's inside the nucleus. So there's a nuclear membrane. So you've got to have a DNA vaccine it has to go across the cell membrane then go into the across the nuclear membrane, then be transcribed. Then so there's extra steps there, I think, which makes it more difficult. And with an mRNA vaccine, you just really just have to get into the nucleus. You know, you don't you only have, so you just have to get across the cell membrane. You don't even go into the nucleus. So I think it makes it much easier to use mRNA vaccine technologies and DNA technologies. We're still waiting to hear from some DNA companies on COVID-19. There's a company called Innovio, which is in the Philadelphia area. That had some that was working with some people to get a DNA vaccine, but I haven't seen data on it yet. I think that the success of mRNA vaccines is probably going to push out DNA vaccines for most most uh, uses because mRNA vaccine, you know, because the problem before was mRNA was so unstable. Remember, mRNA is more unstable than DNA, so they thought we have to find some. We can't the mRNA will get degraded or something, so maybe DNA is better. But they've found ways to make synthetic bases. You know the you know, the nucleosides. They're synthetic bases that are a little bit modified than the natural ones, which gives them stability. That was kind of the big breakthrough in mRNA technology. So that might make DNA vaccines something that really never happens or we never need to use. Um, hi, my name is Krisha. I'm a sophomore or rising junior in California. And my question was, you talked about different characteristics of uh, pandemic causing pathogens. So can one characteristic, characteristic of that kind of pathogen be the ability to spread by touch, like skin contact. Uh, it, it, there are some there are some infections that spread through skin contact. Many bacterial infections, certain viral infections, but again, that's easy to fix by just telling people to stay. You you can. It, it's I think yes. There I I wouldn't think of there would be a pandemic from just only skin to skin contact because you can figure that out. You can tell people to wear gloves. You can tell people to to wash their hands or you, you can tell people to stay, stay apart from each other, close to each other, but not, but not touch each other. That's a lot easier to tell people than when you talk to them, you can, there's, little air, there's little aerosols and little droplets that are going to come out of your mouth that might infect them. So yes, we can get pathogen transmission skin to skin. MRSA is a really good one uh, where you can, a good example, uh, all of the herpes viruses that cause uh, cold sores, that, that's not really skin to skin, it's mucous membrane to mucous membrane, but that can, that can spread that way. We, we, but they don't really cause global calamities because you can intervene with personal protective equipment, meaning just something as simple as, as gloves. But there aren't many things that only spread that way. I, I think we haven't seen that type of 
transmission be be able to really cause a, a fast moving global pandemic that's so disruptive. I think it's it's still going to be respiratory route, although skin transmission can be important for other types of infections. But I think there's too much you can do to stop that or to intervene versus how little you can do to stop people from spreading things when they talk, laugh, yell, scream, all of that, all that, that interaction. If that makes sense. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Adalja. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Yash and I'm a junior in high school. I just wanted to ask how, um, throughout your career, how did you combine medicine and policy starting in college? So I, I, I would say that I probably really only started combining it in earnest when I was already an adult already in training as a, when I was in my infectious disease fellowship. So I was already, you know, over 30 years old when I started doing that in a, in, in a real manner. But what I would say I did is I wanted to have a broad based knowledge of the world and how things work. So I didn't major in biology. I majored in industrial management at Carnegie Mellon here in Pittsburgh. I'm talking to you from Pittsburgh. Um, and that that's really quantitative business. And I think that just, I think if you're going to combine medicine with something else, the more broader base you have, the more understanding of the world and how it works and all the different pieces of it, of politics, of geography, of anthropology, of business, of economics, all of that makes it very easy to make that jump because you know how to speak that language. Whereas someone, not that there's anything wrong with it, but there's some people that might want to go directly into something and say, I want to just do biology and then this and this and this. And they may not necessarily have that interest. I was more interested in everything and I still am. I have a problem kind of narrowing my focus. That's why I, I did a double residency and two fellowships after I finished medical school. And I read outside of my field a lot. So I think that that's how I did it is just by having an interest in the, in the world is at large. And when you think about infectious diseases, that medical specialty more than any other one touches on everything because as you see what happens during a pandemic, the cascading impacts of the pandemic, how it impacts every little thing you do, that makes it really easy for someone that's an infectious disease to bridge that gap because you're already working in a field where you have to think about what does this person do? How does, where did this person travel? Where do they live? What, did they, what are their ho hobby? All of that, that, that kind of integrates into to policy and integrates into how, how societies function. Infectious diseases can disrupt societies, whereas you know cardiology diseases don't really disrupt societies in the same way, if that makes sense. Hi, Dr. Adalja. First of all, thank you so much for giving this presentation. It was very insightful. And also, I'm Gloria. I'm from Pittsburgh, PA. And my question is, in your Alchemy of a Pandemic Pathogen Project, where you found the traits of pathogens that have the ability to cause a pandemic, I'm just curious, like, what was the process or like, what ex um, experiments did you conduct um, to get the quantitative or qualitative data to determine these traits? So it's important. So um, it's good that you're in Pittsburgh. I, I'm curious to know which high school you go to, but you can tell me in a sec second. Um, so in that project, it was more qualitative research, basically a lot of understanding of what happened in the past for with pandemics and trying to uh, understand what trying to just do a lot of thought experiments, just thinking, how would this work? And then what we did is we interviewed about 150 people from all different fields, people that were plant biologists, people who were astrobiologists that were working on bacteria, like the Mars mission, people that, were, um, that, that work on diseases of salamanders and snakes and anybody that I could think of that might have something to say about what could cause a pandemic. I, I just took a lot of time to really drill into that and talk to these people that were sort of not the, off the beaten path, and try and understand what can I learn from all of them and then kind of synthesize it all together. So it was a qualitative project uh, that I did. And, and I, if, you, if you Google that document, um, you can download it. It's just a PDF and you can see all the methods there and how many people I interviewed. Hi, my name is Debbie Miljeku and I'm a rising junior um, in Chicago, Illinois. So my question is about vaccines. Um, how did we find uh, volunteers to do COVID vaccine testing? And yeah, essentially who did we test on? So we found volunteers just, so we're, all the time there's medical research going on everywhere you look in the United States. And it's usually done at big medical centers. So I'm here in Pittsburgh, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. It, it, they, they always are doing clinical studies. So they have a network of people and in the community that they can, the network of people they already know, as well as the community itself, where they, they partner with a company like Moderna or Pfizer, 
And then they advertise saying, we're doing this study, we're enrolling people, uh, this is the criteria, come to our clinical trial site and, and get enrolled if you want to do it. So that's basically how it happens. You basically enroll in a community. There's usually, like I said, a big academic medical center that's helping to put this all together because they do this all the time. So we test it on everybody in the community. I know some of my friends were in the vaccine trials. So anybody that wanted to sign up could sign up as long as they met the criteria uh, for who they were testing it on. But when you do a clinical trial, you don't know if you're going to get the vaccine or you, you might get the placebo, but that's how it's done. Hello. Um, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I'm Naharan from uh, Georgia. And I have a question when you said that bacteria didn't have that much of a potential to cause a huge pandemic. But what about MRSA superbugs that are, anti -re that are resistant to biotics? How w do you think that, that, that would have a potential? So it's important. So, so MRSA is very widespread and bacterial infections are really widespread, but could they cause, when I'm talking about with the pandemic, I'm really talking about a really disruptive event where the society runs into a major issue the way they did with COVID-19. And even though MRSA can be challenging to treat, even though it's everywhere, we still, there's probably about eight, eight different antibiotics that can treat it. Most MRSA and, and MRS, most MRSA infections are skin and soft tissue, meaning you get like uh, you get an, like you get a pus pocket or a blister or something or a skin disease. It's not something that's super catastrophic. I mean, it can be. There are MRSA infections in the, in the lungs, in the bloodstream, uh, on the heart valves that can kill people. However, it's not something that spreads in the manner like a like a, a pandemic would. And we have a lot of tools to be able to to treat MRSA, even though it's challenging. And there are more challenging bacteria than MRSA, but I don't think they can rise to a pandemic threat because we can still put together something to treat them. And this, and they don't. And MRSA, even though it spreads, this is one of the ones that can spread from touch. Um, you can you can intervene very early uh, and have not not have bad consequences. So no, I don't think you know MRSA could cause that kind of a pandemic. I think MRSA is a widespread problem all over the world, but it's not at that same level of alarm that you would see with an infectious disease emergency like a, like a viral pandemic, like bird flu, for example. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm a junior and I'm from the UK. And I just have a question. So linking onto the last question about bacteria, I know that since you've mentioned that bacteria don't usually cause like big disruptive events, but with antibiotic resistance being like a very significant problem to public health, how are new antibiotics discovered? And do you think that it could potentially be a really, really big problem for public health? I, I do think thinking long-term, antimicrobial resistance is probably one of the biggest public health threats that we face because so much of medicine is necessary. Uh, antibiotics are necessary from organ transplants to putting in hip replacements to, ev to everything. So one of the things though I think that limits the scope, so suppose we lost all our antibiotics today, where would we be? We would be living in like 1942. That wasn't really that bad. I mean, it was bad. I mean, people died and things, and people died from infections, but 1942 wasn't um, you know, it wasn't cataclysmic. It's not, you know, some apocalyptic future that we would think about. So I think even if you did that, because, you know, sanitation, hygiene, surgical treatment of infections, all of that are, are important. And, and even with some of the most resistant antibiotic, but are they infecting? They're not infecting the general population. They're infecting people who live in nursing homes. They're infecting people who have multiple chronic diseases near the end of life. So it's sort of delimited. I, so that's why I think it can't cause an acute problem the way, the way a pandemic virus can. How are new antibiotics discovered? So they, they used to be that they, people would just dig up soil because what are antibiotics? Antibiotics are usually things that other microorganisms use against each other. You know, penicillin, is a, penicillin comes from a mold that, that, that uses that, that compound to kill, other, kill bacteria. So that's how they used to do it, just sifting through dirt. Uh, one, one antibiotic used to be called, mis, came from the Mississippi mud. It, it, that's basically what they do. Now they continue to still do that, but in a much more sophisticated manner, they're just screening really fast, almost looking for compounds uh, you know, at the speed of light, just going really quickly through all of that and then finding things that hit and then testing. But a lot of the easy antibiotics to find have, have already been found. So we're, still, we're in a situation where it's increasingly harder to find new antibiotics. All the, most now are kind of, versions of older antibiotics that they're tinkering with, modifying, making a little bit more robust. But that's basically how antibiotic discovery occurs.
Thank you. So it looks like we are out of time today, but thank you so much for your presentation and excellent responses, Dr. Adalja. Uh, it was wonderful to have you at the conference, and we really appreciate you taking the time to speak and for all you do. Sure. Thank you. Feel free to, to tweet to me or email me or get in touch with me if you have any questions. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you.